Now, enough rambling from me. Um, time for the real content to begin. Um, our first keynote uh, is we need more mediocre security engineers. Uh, so, uh, Jackie of all trades, master of none, Jackie Bow has spent time in roles such as a malware analysis, reverse engineer, security engineer, and head of security at places uh, like Facebook, Patreon, and the U.S. government. These days, she can be find scale, uh, found scaling uh, security teams, coaching, and thinking about how to reduce burnout and increase compensation in the industry. Oh, sorry, compassion in the industry. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's important too, you know, that's fine. <laughs> um, Freudian slip. Um, endlessly curious and easily excitable. Uh, she is currently the head of detection response uh, at Asana. Now, without further ado, welcome to the stage, Jackie. everybody. Just for the people in the back, there's still like a bunch of seats in the second row right here. There's some more seats in the front. Please come in. And I forgot I can take my mask off. That's so much better. All right. Awesome. Yeah, and there's some over here as well if you're waiting for a seat. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here, like really excited. Like I was beaming under my mask going up all of those escalators. Besides was the last in-person conference that I went to. And so being up here is really incredible for me. I just want us to take a second to realize that we are here in person. Maybe look to the person next to you. If it's someone you haven't met, say hello. New friends, new friends. I also really want to thank Reed, Tim, and all the organizers. Uh, it's really hard to put on a conference. It's incredibly hard to put on one during a pandemic. And I just really want to give them a lot of kudos for putting this together and getting this community together that I love. And also inviting me up here to give you some of my spicy takes. First, who am I? If you haven't met me, my name is Jackie Bo, and I've been working in the security industry for just over the past 10 years, mostly as an engineer in the realms of malware reverse engineering and threat detection. I've definitely dabbled a lot. I've done cloud security, product security, corporate security, DevSecOps, as well as tours as the head of security and leading product security. And now I'm directing threat detection and response at Asana. I love solving puzzles. That's why I love this industry. I love whether they're technical, interpersonal, or organizational. I think of myself as endlessly curious and somewhat easily bored, which is why I'm a security engineer, which is why I love this industry. But, okay, before we go any further, let's talk about my talk title. So the word mediocre kind of feels like I am just lightly slapping you with a you know, white leather glove. It feels like an insult just to say this word. Why did I choose it? And why did I say I want more of this in our industry? Well, first, I chose it because it's spicy. I chose it because it would get you thinking. It would get you maybe interested to come and hear me talk. I also chose it because our perception of this word being so negative, if we look at the actual definition, it's of only moderate quality, not very good, pretty benign, not actually that negative of a definition, but our perception of it is pretty negative. And I just want you to think about that as we go through this talk, how we can kind of change uh, what things are by how we perceive them. So first, I wanna share a story. So imagine me, a brand new security engineer at Facebook. I've been hired to mostly do malware reverse engineering. Uh, to try to track actors using the platform to spread malware. 
So I'm given an assignment, I'm given a binary, and I am told to find a signature that we can deploy to stop this spreading on platform. So, you know, pop up Ida Pro, looking for patterns. I am gonna write a signature in Clam AV, which is, in my opinion, still the best open source antivirus there is. And I find a pattern in the binary that I can use to uniquely key, write it in the HDB format, feeling pretty good, and I push it to production. Those of you who have been to Facebook Classic Campus know that there is a place called The Sweet Stop. It has some of the best ice cream, and I love ice cream. So of course what I do after I push this signature is I go get myself ice cream, and I'm very proud of myself. I'm like, you know, there was a reason they hired me. There's a reason I'm here. I'm gonna make Zuck proud. This is great. I get my ice cream cone, and it's mint chocolate chip with rainbow sprinkles because I'm chaotic, and I'm walking back, feeling really good. I get back to my desk, and I see my manager, who's my mentor and the person who brought me out to work at Facebook, and he's like huddled over his laptop doing something. And I'm like, what's, what's going on? And he's like, well, the AV tier crashed. And I'm like, oh. And he's like, yeah, a signature was pushed, and uh, it's, it's crashing the tier. Think about Clam AV signatures. If you forget a new line at the end of the text file, it crashes. It just does not work. Our AV tier also at this time did not have linters or things to check for this. So effectively, I stopped file uploads to Facebook Messenger for more than an hour, but less than three. Ice cream ruined. So why do I share this story? Mostly because I think all of us have stories like this. Some of us have multiple. I like to tell this story to all of my reports the first time they crash production. Because the truth is, we aren't perfect. None of us are perfect. And throughout my career, this has just popped up again and again. And the thing is, no one is perfect. This is in part why we have jobs. It is our job security, the fact that humans make errors. I want to point out this quote from the DBIR report. Thank you, DBIR writers. Uh, that talks about uh, the human element and that the human element continues to drive breaches. This year, 82% of breaches involved this human element, whether it is the use of stolen credentials, phishing, misuse, or a simple error, people continue to play a very large role in incident and breaches alike. Turns out, ironically, that systems built by humans are susceptible and vulnerable to humans themselves. I know, I know, it's wild. But for some reason, in this industry, we believe that as security practitioners, we need to be perfect. And in return, we expect each other to be perfect. Infallible, amazing hackers that always save the day and never forget to include the new line at the end of their files. Who have never reused a password or ever been a beginner at anything. We set unrealistic goals for ourselves to know everything we pretty much just expect ourselves to be unicorns. What's more is we expect that we're doing security work not just in our jobs, but we're also hacking on side projects. We're doing capture the flags, we're reading white papers, we're keeping up with InfoSec Twitter, which, have you been on there? Oh. And also, hey, going to conferences on Saturdays, yeah. Basically, we have this perception that in order to be a great security engineer or practitioner, security has to be your life. There seems to be this idea that by living and breathing and only doing security, we're actually making ourselves better professionals and keeping the world more secure. I have a hypothesis, though, that our extreme expectations of ourselves and each other drive burnout, not excellence. We have this idea that more is better you know, living, breathing, only doing security. But just as noise doesn't make better alerts in a sim, hyperfixating on perfection doesn't make us invulnerable to attacks. More doesn't actually equal better. What more equals here is burnout. Okay, but what is burnout really? You know, we throw this term around a lot these days. 
Uh, in two, like, as of 2019, it actually has its own entry in the International Classification of Diseases, ICD-11. So burnout is a reaction to prolonged or chronic job stress and is characterized by three main dimensions. Exhaustion, cynicism, and feelings of reduced professional ability. So wait, cynical, exhausted, with some crushing imposter syndrome, maybe masquerading as ego? Seems like we already ticked some of those boxes. And thank you to Shutterstock for this content. So what are the effects of burnout? There's actually a lot of physical and psychological effects, including all of these. Type two diabetes, coronary heart disease, headaches, prolonged fatigue, insomnia, depression. And I also believe that our work predisposes us to burnout more so than many other industries. Has anyone here experienced burnout or something like it? Raise your hands. Nice, thank you for your honesty. So I myself is burnt out pretty mul like multiple times. It's actually part of why I'm standing up here in front of you. I'm an advocate for preventing burnout and burnout prevention uh, because of the mental and physical toll that I know that it takes. It's a big reason why I'm a manager now of people because I wanna help others who love this field and who are passionate about security be able to do it for a long time. So why would cybersecurity predispose us to burnout? Let's just kind of take a look at the past couple years. First, we have coronavirus, which pushed everyone to pretty much do everything on the internet, whether it was basic human connection, healthcare, groceries, jobs. We saw the pandemic push the adoption of digital means an incredible amount. We also had the ever fun Log4j, which a lot of us spent quite a few hours over some holidays working on and still are working on now. We had the colonial pipeline hack, which caused a rush to gas pumps, like a real physical implication. We had the solar wind supply chain attack, which for me kind of shook me because the FireEye tool set was exposed. And as someone who is a malware analyst, like growing up as a malware analyst, I looked to Mandian and FireEye as the people who knew everything. And for them to get their tools exposed, for me, who considers myself pretty jaded at this point, I was shook. And then, you know, there's massive geopolitical uh, issues that are still increasing with huge cyber powers like Russia. So what are the effects of burnout specifically on our industry? The first and most obvious is we just leave. We just stop working. The second, which is more insidious, is we're less willing to train and connect with each other. We're so busy working and attending that we, we don't connect. And the last is we stay reactive. We only can handle what's coming up and there's things coming up all the time. I like to call it the wheel of reactive hell. This is where we end up when we're underwater with alerts and PRs and open roles and new headlines and it's pulling us in all different directions. It is the voice I hear most people speaking from when they're burning out. I have a hypothesis. Again, I have many hypotheses. <laughs> we are stuck in a reactive loop of burnout and a bit of it is of our own design. I wanna talk about some numbers. We have 600,000 open roles currently. And from Microsoft's uh, calculations, it will be up to 2.5 million open roles. For reference, the number of people working in this field is just over a million. That means our field needs to grow by at least more than two thirds to meet current demand. We are no longer in the days of trying to convince Stuxnet, trying to convince people that Stuxnet, Stuxnet is a real thing which I remember conversations with my parents trying to explain what Stuxnet was. We are in an age where cybersecurity is everybody's business and we're not scaling to meet that. We're not gonna scale to meet these numbers. And what's more, do you know who's gonna do these jobs? It's gonna be us. 
Our current burn rate is unsustainable. We're burning people out faster than we're bringing people in. I have some ideas, though. So what do we need to do? We need to dismantle this security unicorn. We need to challenge these perceptions of who we are as security practitioners and who can be a security practitioner. So I have some ideas on how to do this. So how do we dismantle it? First, we have to start seeing each other as allies rather than competitors. Second, we need to tackle our tendency to overwork and as well glorify overworking. And finally, and most importantly, we need to change our perceptions of who is worth hiring. First, let's talk about allies, not competitors. First off, and pretty basically, we're just not that nice to each other. Whether it is someone that's currently working in this field, looking to get into this field, our customers, the general public, our parents, we're just kind of elitist, standoffish. We're more likely to challenge each other's intelligence than get down to working together. We have this idea that as security practitioners, we must know everything already off the bat. And what's more, we must be the only person to know everything. There's this thing in cybersecurity, it's an affliction, and it's going around. It may get you. It's this idea of scarcity, this idea that knowledge can only be gotten by a scarce few. That there is some artificial ceiling to the number of experts we can have in this industry, this predetermined height that only so many people can get to, and if one person gets up there, another person can't join them. This is something that I've seen out play again and again, especially over Twitter, where people are berating each other for not knowing things, for being less intelligent, challenging each other on what they know. And the issue is that we're not going to scale to meet the needs for cybersecurity if we are alone in a tower. And I think of our, a lot of our antisocial behaviors come from this idea of scarcity, come from this idea that we can't have too many people who are experts. But the issue is we just can't scale solo. We can't keep up. It's not the time for towers. It's not the time for creating your treasure piles of knowledge of op codes and lording over them. If we are going to scale this industry to meet the demands of an even more networked world, we're going to need to drop the lead hacker stuff. An interesting thing is social isolation and loneliness increase, increases the odds of an early death by 25 to 30%. In this same UK study, they compared it to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Fun fact, another study found that an antidote to burnout is connection. It's not leaning into isolation, it's connecting with other people. Not responding to more bug bounty reports. The thing is, elitism doesn't make any of us better. It is time to take all of the hacker tickets that you've earned at the Chuck E. Cheese of hackers and turn it in for that stuffed toy or lava lamp at the desk, Greg, because they're not worth anything here anymore. Also, closer to home, elitism is the enemy of diversity. It's been shown when a group is in the minority, it actually increases competition. And I wish I could say that this is something that hasn't affected me in my career. But women right now, we're only 24% of the cybersecurity workforce, which is actually up from 19% in 2019. So holla to coronavirus for getting more ladies in the industry. We could probably do a whole talk on that. But I have firsthand experienced what it is like to be one of one or two women in a group of 30 to 60 uh, men and feeling like we were duking it out for that novelty position of female engineer. In fact, my talk title was inspired by this incredible blog post by Emily Wen, who's a software engineer titled, I Need Terrible Female Engineers. It summarizes that the competition and expectations for perfection for women who are in the minority is making the field intolerable. So we add this on top of the already crushing pressure to be a 100% hacker all the time, and we have a perfect recipe for everyone being the same. Coming back to our, our tower. 
And I want to go back to this ivory tower and talk about how disconnection makes us not see the forest through the trees and actually makes us miss pretty important things. So again, I'm at Facebook. It's around late 2015. And one of our threat intel folks comes to me and she says, hey, I think we should start looking at all of these weird memes that these groups that we are attributing to Russian actors are posting. It's a lot of weird, like, controversy and like, just lots of weird stuff. We should look at this. You know what I said to her? Is there malware? She's like, no, no, it's just posts and Facebook groups and they're cropping up. Ugh, you know, if it's not malware, I don't think it's important because I was so obsessed that the only thing that mattered was the most technical thing, which was reversing malware. The funny thing, besides the fact that she was talking about Russian troll groups right before the 2016 election, whoops, uh, is also now that all of that hard won, you know, assembly and uh, malware reverse engineering skills that I learned, now it's all about SaaS. Now we're all in the application layer and it's all cross-site request forgery and I feel like a dinosaur. So yeah, let's talk about always being on. And this thing where we just can't really disconnect from what we do. And uh, why can't we disconnect? One is we love what we do. I think for a large number of us, this is also a passion. This is also something that we are incredibly uh, interested in. But also, we have to keep up with headlines. Things are changing all the time. But like sitting here, there probably was another you know, confluence vulnerability or something happening. Also, security, sorry. <laughs> Security breaches could happen at any time. In fact, I bet there's one happening right now. Listen, yesterday I took a day off and I'm looking at my head of security. I did not take the day off. I jumped into incident response. See, lest you think I am up here on my, you know, cloud of a perfect work-life balance. The other thing is we are rewarded for it. When we catch those breaches, when we answer the executive at 2 a.m. who has his hit Twitter hacked because he's using the same password everywhere, we get props for that. And then it becomes expected. Oh, you know, security engineers are always working. They're always on. It's fine. You can ping them at 2 a.m. It's fine. They love this. This is the wheel of reactive hell. We get stuck in this because there is always more work to do always more work to do. We have to make peace with this. We have to accept that there will always be another alert. There will always be another CVE. There will always be something that's happening. And that glorifying overworking or making it that it is the norm actually hurts us all. It means we'll burn out faster. And insidiously, it means that we will block people out of this industry who have other things in their lives like children, family, or, you know, lesser things like mental health, happiness, and hobbies. So I challenge all of you, when your partner or friend or parent or dog asks you when you're on your laptop at 7 p.m., how much more work do you have to do? You say, you know, it's okay. I can stop. And then maybe eat dinner because I know that's something I'm terrible at. And especially for those of you early in your careers, I encourage you to do this because these habits that you set up, they will stick with you for the next decade. Yeah. Also, I believe your best work happens when you have space to think. When you're able to get off the factory floor and you're able to think about how the factory works, when you can start applying your engineering brain to thinking about automations and how we can actually automate ourselves out of having to do that incident response, out of having to triage those alerts. You know that thing that happens when you take a vacation and you come back and there's that problem you were working on? And actually, I mean a vacation of more than a week. I don't mean that vacation was like, I took half a day off, yeah. You take a vacation, more than a week, you come back, you sit down, and you're like, 
Oh, yeah. Duh, I could just do this. This makes sense. That is the magic of Slack space in your brain. Our brains are incredible, and they're at their most capable, most creative, when they're given the time to rest and digest and process what we're doing. If we're just slurping down cybersecurity content, reversing encoding, we're likely to be caught up in that reactive wheel of hell, susceptible to picking up the next piece of reactive work rather than knowing what makes the most impact. I don't know who needs to hear this, but this is something that I wish was said to me more often earlier in my career. So I'm gonna say it to you now. You can be a great security engineer and still have hobbies that have nothing to do with security. <laughs> nothing to do. I'm not talking about loosely adjacent things. I'm talking about nothing to do. I will share mine. I'm an aerial artist. I hang upside down. I think it helps all the instant response shit fall out of my brain. Excuse my language. Um, I also am a devoted helicopter dog parent to these two, uh, <laughs> these two muffins. Yeah, that's what I do when I'm not doing security. I also encourage you to talk to each other about what you do. Whether you like baking bread, or you like hip hop, or you're a rapper, or a DJ, talk to each other about what you do that isn't security. Make it the norm that you can do other things. And lastly, my most important topic is this talent gap and how we're gonna bridge it. But actually, I think there's someone who's better to talk about this first. So I'm gonna queue up uh, Steven here, who has a message for all of us. Can I have some support making sound happen? Hey, do you want to make a difference fighting bad guys and making six figures? Well, do we have the job for you? I got so excited. <laughs> Hey, do you want to make a difference fighting bad guys and making six figures? Well, do we have the job for you. You don't have to be Iron Man. You can work in cybersecurity. Hell yeah. The U.S. government estimates a labor shortage of about 400,000 people over the next few years in this industry. Here are the three simple things that you need to fill these jobs. One, you need to have 10 years of related job experience. Two, need to have multiple accredited certifications. And three, most importantly, you gotta be a rock star. Does this sound like you? No, no, that doesn't sound like me at all. Awesome. Come on down and apply at entrylevelcybersecurityjobs.com. We're waiting. It's time to sell drugs. Thank you. I highly recommend, yeah. Give it up for Steven. Yeah. <laughs> I highly recommend checking out his TikTok, as Zifo says. He also does stand up community around the Bay. Incredibly funny person. So let's get back into it. Why can't we hire? Could it be that we're looking for unicorns? Okay, I'm going to say some things and. All right, why can't we hire? We have this prerequisite that everyone needs to come to us already with an engineering degree in order to be valuable. Second, when we actually interview people, we don't test for the right things. So degrees are a privilege. It remains that a four-year university or college is still something that while it's becoming more accessible, is not something that is available to the wide socioeconomic uh, part of our, of our country and our world. 
It is still a marker of privilege to be able to attend a college right after school. We still apply this idea that we live in a meritocracy and naturally those who are gifted or intelligent naturally will get siphoned into university or college and will get that engineering degree before they get to us. And I'm sorry, but this just isn't true. And it keeps us kind of in this heterogeneous collection that we're currently in. I heard someone clapping, you can clap for me. <laughs> I like validation. All right. So this is from an Aspen Institute study about uh, diversity in the cybersecurity industry. So it says, while it's been noted that academic degrees do not necessarily imply a more advanced level of skill, it has typically been considered a hiring prerequisite for most employees. So we have little evidence that getting to us with a degree makes you better at the job. But wait, before we go too far, lest you think I am railing on the you know, education as a whole. I think education is invaluable. I consider myself a forever learner. I love learning new things. And I think the, the ability to get educated and to go to college and to go get certificates and go to boot camps is invaluable and necessary. I think learning the principles of engineering unlocks in your brains the ability to automate all of this manual trash that we have to do right now. I believe that it's the future of our industry. I just don't think it has to happen before you get into the industry. And I believe that availability to education should be a job benefit for any role in cybersecurity. Now, now you're all like, oh, clap for her, she likes it. <laughs> okay. Um, but let me take a step back and talk about how we have this area between people who don't have degrees and lots of job openings. And there have been a, there's been an industry that has grown to fill this, boot camps and certificates. These courses, which are usually very expensive, sometimes promise people that if they go through them, they will get a job, which is misleading at best. The truth is in this moment in our industry, we do not have any standardized way to think about certificates or boot camps as a sign of proficiency. This is a problem. Here's another uh, quote from that Aspen Institute study. There is little evidence about whether these programs have been effective in closing that gap uh, and increasing non-traditional candidates in cybersecurity. It still remains that a computer science or an engineering degree is the universally agreed upon prerequisite. And again, my belief is that if we offer education as a benefit, not as a prerequisite, we can start to fill that talent gap. All right, secondly, let's say you actually get your resume into a recruiter and they're looking at it. Great, you get scheduled for that onsite. You get to your onsite and, oh, a lot of algorithms questions. I mean, it is just the normal cocktail joke that you have with people when you're like, oh yeah, you interviewed at that thing company. Did you have to balance a binary tree or red black? No, this is not how we should evaluate people for cybersecurity roles. In fact, this is someone who's a software engineer and he's making fun of the interview process. The fact is we just don't know how to evaluate talent. And I wish I had the best answers for that, but I don't. I think it's something that we need to think about. But you know, technical rigor, security is hard. I'm talking about hiring people with different backgrounds and heaven forbid, no degree or a degree in an unrelated field. Won't we fail? Security engineering is difficult. It takes hard work. And I agree. I think security is a particular field that requires curiosity, tenacity, and a lot of stubbornness. You have to love this. You have to put in the work, but you should be able to put in that work and get return on your investment. But wait, we have 600,000 open roles. We don't have time to train people. We're underwater already. That's the wheel of reactive hell speaking people. What do we need to do? 
We need to leverage these boot camps, these trainings, these conferences, these degree programs as expected parts of the job. We need to hire people who maybe don't have that computer science background and send them to college while they're with us. Heck, I got my master's degree nights and weekends while I was working for the government. In fact, the government paid for it in return for me working for them. That kind of system works. Also, we talk about this pipeline problem and the pipeline problem is this idea that people just aren't qualified when they get to us. And we talk about it as if it's something that will sort itself out or it's not our responsibility. You know, it's the responsibility of the colleges. They need to teach more computer science. It's the responsibility of the high schools. It's the responsibility of the middle schools, the elementary schools, the preschools. It's Lego's responsibility. It's not ours. The issue is that we're all gonna burn out before this pipeline problem fixes itself. It's all of our problem. And so lastly, just want to go through again what it means to dismantle the unicorn. So first, seeing each other as allies. Everyone in this room, you're great. You are my ally. Rather than competitors, we don't have to quiz each other on who knows more uh, you know, <laughs> crypto algorithms or have you read the most recent headline? We don't have to poke holes in what other people tell us they do to see if they actually belong to sit at the table. We need to dismantle this glorification of overwork. We need to tackle it and think more about how we can both live lives and be security practitioners. And we finally, we need to change our perception of who is worth hiring in the industry. And so I wanna leave you with a challenge. Just like in the beginning, I talked about that word mediocre and how negative it is, but just how benign the definition is. It's okay to be a beginner. It's okay to not know everything. It's okay to be curious. And I want you to challenge who you think belongs in this industry. And I think this is the answer for a more diverse and sustainable industry. So let's lower the gates. Let's bring more people in and yeah, Let's make this industry what it can be. Yeah, we need all of you. And for everyone in this room who maybe took a seat and looked around and was like, I don't see many people who look like me or, you know, I just don't know if I'm cut out for this. You are, you definitely are. And if you need to be reminded, this is my Twitter. I'm sometimes on it, but <laughs> you can find me on other platforms and I will tell you, you belong here. You're great. Okay, thank you. Still, I'm still standing up here. Should I just keep talking? Who have questions? Does anyone have questions? Do we have time for questions? What are my dog's names? Oh, yes, okay, so I have a two and a half year old Pomeranian named Luna, who is chaos incarnate, and I have a almost 16 year old uh, terrier mix, who is ornery and curmudgeonly. <laughs> I love that that's, that's the question. Where do I, oh, that is such a good question. Where do I think mentoring fits into all of this? I would not be where I am without the mentors who believed in me, especially when I had no belief in myself. Like when I was a grad student and I was sitting at the CSOC at MITRE trying to decode a PCAP and I just had no idea what I was doing. My mentors believed in me and I think, yeah, mentorship is one of the biggest gifts you can give someone. Yes. Oh, do I have advice for people who want to be better mentors? Just do it. Just try. Like, yeah, be okay with failing. Be okay with not knowing everything. Just sit with someone. Doing ride-alongs is incredibly valuable, especially like as a blue teamer. What you do is more of an art than a science. So having people watch what you do and learn from you uh, is mentorship in itself. Don't overthink it. Can I take can I take more questions? I feel like Yeah, okay, they're they're nodding. 
Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love that, like a cohort. So the question is like, what about a program where instead of just hiring one security engineer, you hire five people and just kind of throw them into the, the fire? And yeah, no, I love that idea. I think that is kind of like what we, what we do with internships, except our internship programs usually only uh, accept people from software engineering backgrounds. So I love the idea of like having some kind of you know, little test or people can do on their own time. Like, you know, can you, can you use Google, which is probably one of the, <laughs> the most important things to being a security engineer. If they can, you know, pass like a little, uh, like a little mini capture the flag, bring them on. Totally. I think that's great. Okay. Thank you.